welcome back, welcome back. Yes, I was back there jamming, man. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm a professor of cybersecurity, and so I'm always eager to bring some of the coolest, most in-depth stuff to my students, right? Because that's what they deserve. Well, I actually used some of uh, the, the product and information of our next presenter in my class right before coming here. It's too funny. Anyway, VP of product at 8th Wall, let me introduce to you Tom Emrick. We bring on screen. Oh, God. Oh, can you go back? Hey, everybody. Uh, did this just unlock a number of memories for you? Who remembers that sound? Yeah, I feel you. Me too. Uh, and we're going to be unlocking a lot of memories today over the next course of the 25 minutes because we're going to be uh, looking at our technological past to glean insights that we can take with us into building the next wave of computing. Uh, and, you know, we're building something new here, and that means that our focus is on the future. I want to take this time to look to the past, understand the patterns and cycles of the past wave of computing in order to help us prepare for them, in order to help give us context as to where we might be, to see what we want to repeat, what we don't want to repeat, and also to zoom out so that we understand that what we're building is the next leg of a technological journey that we've been on for decades. And I'm specifically going to be looking at the PC and the mobile waves of computing in four categories. And the categories are terminology, hardware, platforms, and content creation, and culture. So let's go. Uh, when my Twitter feed blew up, which I'm sure yours did with the word metaverse, I knew I needed to start my presentation off with taking a look at the terminology of past waves of computing. And this is what I found. What I found is a couple of patterns. First is, early on in a wave of computing, uh, the industry and the inner circle is filled with technical jargon. And this makes sense because the technology is just invented, solutions are just deployed and produced, and we need terms to be able to talk to one another about it. And so in the PC era, we had TCP IP and internet work. In the mobile era, we had WAP, SMS, MMS and fast forward to today, and we have AR, VR, MR, XR. What I also found is that when these ingredients are more cemented, thought leaders and visionaries start putting the pieces of the puzzles together to try to describe what we're trying to achieve. And what they do is they look to fiction, especially science fiction, to find a term that really suits this. And thus, we have information superhighway, cyberspace, and the metaverse. But ultimately, as we move along our adoption curve, it is the consumer who will popularize the label or the term of what we're up to. And uh, this means that a lot of the technical jargon doesn't make its way to the consumer sphere. Or if it does, they end up shortening it. For example, the internet becomes the net. World Wide Web becomes the web. Or they find a, a word that more plainly describes what the technology is about or what it does, like text message instead of SMS. These terms, they change over time with each generation. Um, and also, when a brand cements itself as a category leader, consumers often don't describe the technology, but instead they use the brand synonymously with that technology. For example, iPhone in lieu of smartphone, Google in lieu of the web. And to really drive home just how far we've come with our terminology and how much it changes generation by generation, I stumbled upon this video on YouTube, The Kid's Guide to the Internet by Diamond Entertainment Corporation, produced in 1997. I'm going to play a small clip. Uh, it features the Jamesons family, who it, they're really excited to talk about the World Wide Web and what it's all about. So watch and especially listen to the terminology being used. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. Okay, guys, the first thing that you need to know is that the internet is amazing and it's changing every day. Once you've learned how to get online yourselves, you'll start seeing web pages everywhere. 
TV shows have them, schools, Disney World, even the White House. What's a web page? Something ducks walk on? <laughs> ha ha, very funny. No, it's the name of the different sites you can look up on the internet. Hold on, sis. Let's start at the beginning like Dad did with us. So Andrew and Lisa will be able to persuade their parents about the internet with some important facts. Good idea, Peter, but where do we start? Let's start with the basics first. There are three important services you can access on the internet. Surfing the World Wide Web. Surfing? That sounds pretty cool already. Okay, <laughs> it does sound cool. Uh, so what are some of the insights from the past waves of computing that we can take into the next one? Well, the first is that terms, uh, they come and go. And many of the terms that we use within our inner circles will not make it to the mainstream. And so the too long don't read is don't get hung up on terminology, especially don't let it distract you from building the things that we're trying to describe. The second is that ultimately the consumer will be um, the, the endpoint that will give the name of the technology that we're creating. And so as we move along the adoption curve, I think it's really important for us to listen to our users, listen to our consumers, to understand the language that they're using and use that to our advantage. Um, and, and ultimately, um, we uh, see, as I mentioned, from past ways of computing that brand names win out. And so, again, listening to the consumer space for the brands that are on the tip of their tongues can really help us understand who the emerging category leaders are. So let's turn and take a look at hardware. And hardware and connectivity typically define a wave of computing. And when we look at the past ways of computing, the PC wave and the mobile wave, we see three things. The first is that we see new devices uh, uh, go along a very common journey, academia to military, military to enterprise, enterprise to the consumer space. The second is that devices that are new, they start very large and then they miniaturize over time, but yet they get more powerful. And as they enter the consumer space, there is a distinct focus on des design and aesthetic. And the third is that devices over time get more mobile, they get more portable, they start leaving the rooms and the cars of which they're installed and can be used in the outside world. And this has a lot to do um, in, uh, with the uh, uh, evolution and um, the advancements in connectivity. And so if we look at the hardware um, PC era timeline, we first see after a stint in the US Army uh, where it was first used, room-sized IBM uh, uh, computers in 1964 be used in the enterprise before making its way in a more um, a, a form factor that we're used to. The IBM personal computer in 1983 was um, ushered in. And then thanks to connectivity advancements and computer components, we start to see this device get smaller, more portable, a la netbooks, laptops, Chromebooks, and also tablets with keyboards. And this is the same journey that mobile phones also followed. And before I show you what that timeline looks like, let's go back to 1990 to take a look at a Radio Shack commercial, shall we? Finding a phone in a car isn't that unusual anymore, except when it leaves the car for greener pastures, the high seas, or a leisurely lunch. Radio Shack keeps you in constant communication with their affordable, transportable cellular telephone. Hello? Oh, well, yes, he's right here. It's for you. Yes, I heard about the merger. 500 shares. The affordable, <laughs> transportable cellular telephone. Only at Radio Shack. Okay. <laughs> I love all this humor. Okay, so looking at the mobile wave of computing, we see very similar patterns. We see in 1956, the very first automated mobile phone system for vehicles was launched in Sweden by Telia Sonera and Ericsson. Uh, and actually, this was named the MTA, and it was connected to the public phone system. And so it's very a la that room size IBM computer. Uh, fast forward to 1983, nearly, uh, what, 25, 30 years later, and the very first portable cellular phone, which sold for $4,000, debuted by Motorola. It was the Dynatac 8000X. And then we hit the tipping point for consumers with a very small feature phone, my favorite, Motorola Razor. Uh, and at the same time, around the early 2000s, we had the BlackBerry Pearl, the T-Mobile Sidekick. I'm sure many of you have these in your hands. And it was January 9th, 2007, when Steve Jobs took the stage, debuted the very first iPhone, and the rest, they say, is history. 
And although we're very early in, in many ways, with our AR VR head worn journey, I wanted to show this video from NASA Ames Research Center of NASA's virtual environment display system to show, again, the progression from academia to military, military to the enterprise, enterprise to consumer, as well as that miniaturization to see just as far, just how far we've come. The virtual environment display system is a multi-sensory interactive display environment in which a user can virtually explore a 360 degree synthesized or remotely sensed environment and can viscerally interact with its components. The objective of this research is to develop a multi-purpose operator interface environment with initial applications in telerobotics, <laughs> data management, and human factors research. Okay, who wants to play Supernatural on that? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna sweat for sure. Okay, so what insights can we uh, take away from the pathways of computing into this next one when we're building? Well, the first is to honor, understand, and respect that natural journey of new devices. Again, academia to military, military to enterprise, enterprise to consumer. Um, and you can, you can see this already with AR smart glasses in particular, where you know, after an experimental stint in 2012, 2013, Google Glass found its home at work, the HoloLens and Magic Leap devices really proving ROI in the, in the enterprise. We've obviously seen a really good example already of miniaturization in VR head-worn devices. If you compare the um, virtual uh, display system from NASA to you know, even the Oculus DK1, it's quite a tremendous um, uh, accomplishment within the VR industry. But even looking at the Oculus DK1 to the MetaQuest 2, um, we're seeing that miniaturization as well. Uh, but one thing to note here is that uh, with the MetaQuest 2, although it's smaller, it's still confined to the living room, still confined to the home. We're not bringing it out into our everyday world. Um, and so it's very much like the personal um, computer. Uh, and then uh, furthermore, uh, we really need to remark the role connectivity plays in parallel to the hardware journey. Going back to the mobile phone era, 2G ushered in text messaging devices. 3G ushered in devices that could allow for browsing on the internet. 4G enabled rich media on mobile phones. And so we need to look to the full rollout of 5G as well as 6G and Wi-Fi 6 and see the role that they're gonna play with the AR VR head worn space. Of course, the value of, of hardware is unlocked by software, and I wanted to take a look at the platforms, especially the operating systems, era to era. And the big thing to note here is that the leaders of the PC wave were not the same leaders of the mobile wave, which means that often we see a shuffle one wave to the next. Um, and that shuffle could be due to a couple of factors. The first is legacy thinking, where uh, the success strategies of the PC wave were attempted to be ported into the mobile wave, and it did not work. The second is a lack of understanding of what consumers really value about that new technology and an inability to move from the enterprise to the consumer sphere, which is very important, especially as our devices are expected to do double duty as work and play devices. And the third is a developer ecosystem. Healthy, thriving, successful, successful developer ecosystems is key to the success of platforms and those that really nurtured and created it as well as provided monetization structures to allow for these developers to succeed, they also succeeded. What we also saw um, uh, from wave to wave is that new devices do not replace old devices. When our smartphone came around, we didn't stop using our PC, we didn't stop using our laptop. So let's go back to 2010, shall we, when web designer Ethan Marcotti uh, coined the phrase responsive web design. What was happening? Well, at that time, it was three years after the iPhone had launched, there was a huge demand for iPhone sites. Uh, Steve Jobs had just taken the stage to debut the iPad, which means Wow, there's gonna be iPad sites. So you have desktop sites, you have iPad sites, you have iPhone sites. This is crazy, that's a lot to ask for the development community. And so Ethan, in his infamous blog post, uh, coined the term responsive web design in order to allow for developers to develop once and deploy across various screen sizes. So fast forward to today, and we find ourselves in a very similar um, situation where we have new devices that are coming on board, AR headborne devices, VR headborne devices, and a new type of experience going to the web, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D. 
And so are we to ask developers to create experiences individually for each of these devices? No. And so there's a need for a new responsive web. And if you saw the news this morning, 8th Wall has a solution for that with our reality engine, which just launched. And as this presentation is all about, thank you, I'll thank you. Yeah, pause, pause for clapping. <laughs> and as this presentation is all about connecting the dots between the history and our present where we're building the future, I thought it was no better time to bring to the stage my friend and CEO and founder of 8th Wall, Eric Murphy Katorian, uh, who will be here to talk a little bit more about the reality engine. Eric, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be up on stage to announce the launch of 8th Wall's all new reality engine. Um, this is a powerful platform that lets you build web based augmented reality building that project once and deploying it to all types of devices, from smartphones to desktop computers to AR headsets and VR headsets. Um, in addition, with 8th Wall's Reality Engine's metaversal deployment, you can take projects that were created for mobile smartphones with touch gestures and 2D interactions, and you can bring them immediately and automatically to VR headsets, to AR headsets, and you can experience them in space, things that you created for a mobile phone can be experienced in real space. And we've done everything that you need to take your hand gestures and map them to either hand controls or control control, I mean, your controllers on your, on your MetaQuest or your WASD keyboard on your mouse, uh, and your uh, WASD keyboard on your laptop along with a mouse, and solve all of the tough problems that go into taking that kind of user input, mapping it to something that will work on all types of devices and making it incredibly simple to get started. Um, you know, this has been 8th Wall's mission all along to make it easy to build immersive technology, to build applications that work everywhere, and to try to foster in deployment to new types of hardware. Um, today, we are at a crossroads where head-worn devices are becoming mainstream, mobile phones are still a dominant piece of technology, and every, you know, people are using laptops every day for productivity. And we are making it so this technology can run across all of them. And I'm really excited to get to this point and definitely encourage you to try it out. Uh, so Tom's going to queue a video. And thanks again. I really hope you try out this product. It's been a long time in the making. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. I know I work at 8th Wall, but I'm also 8th Wall's number one fan. I can't underscore enough what you saw. One website working on smartphones, computers, AR headsets, VR headsets, tablets. Uh, mind blowing. OK, so when we look at platforms and, and content creation, what insights from the past ways of computing can we bring into building the next one? Well, the first is, as you recall, that there's typically a shuffle, which means that there's a potential for no new leaders in the headborne wearable space. So be on the lookout for leading indicators. Who is creating healthy developer ecosystems? Who in the enterprise has what it takes to transition from the enterprise to the consumer space? In addition, um, we also know that with this new device category, we're expected to not replace, at least not right away, all of our devices, but in, instead add to the device constellation of the user. And so this, um, in turn, really requires for cross-platform interoperable solutions. OK, the last category, culture. You can have ready-to-go hardware, ready-to-go software, but if people aren't ready to adopt it, it's game over. It could slow it down. And so people are really important, and I want to take some time to take a look back at the past waves of computing, uh, in particular to look at the role of pop culture in adoption, as well as to look at the need for new social contracts and oftentimes new legislation due to growing new societal concerns around privacy, security, health, and safety. Uh, and so um, on the pop culture side, let's take a look back at the mobile wave of computing. 
Uh, pop culture plays a huge role in educating and also helping to adopt new technology. Outside of early adopters, which I'm sure we all are because we're here at an AR VR conference, uh, the mainstream likes to follow, not lead. And so they look to media, they look to influencers, celebrities, and film to be able to understand what the new technology is. And often this technology is planted. Alan, 1987. Um, Michael Douglas uh, uh, plays Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street with uh, the Dynatech 8000. That's that $4,000 device I talked about. Uh, fast forward to 1995, now called classic Clueless, another Dynatech device, obviously now miniaturized, smaller, and more uh, targeted to young adults. And then we can follow along that journey, especially through early influencers like Kim Kardashian, Lindsay Lohan, Paris Hilton, who all sported new phones, um, I swear, like every week, whether it's a Sidekick or a bedazzled Blackberry Pearl or the new iPhone. They all played a major role in the adoption of mobile phones. In addition, we saw growing societal concerns around mobile technology. In 2001, New York was the first to roll out legislation to ban texting while driving to help uh, alleviate distracted driving concerns. In 2003, camera phones outsold digital cameras, and therefore they began to be banned in gyms, locker rooms, and restaurants. And just as um, recent as 2018, this was on the news. In a city where people are seemingly addicted to talking and texting, some restaurant owners are requesting you put down the phone and focus on the person in front of you. You walk by a table and somebody's playing a video game. Our people have uh, made a note that they're celebrating their anniversary and you barely see them speak to each other during the course of a two and a half hour dinner. Okay, so what can we take and learn from the pathways of computing into building this next one? Well, the first and foremost is to remember that we're building for people and that uh, ultimately the buck stops with people and we need to solve for um, the societal um, and, and cultural expectations of these uh, new technologies that we're working on. The second is the role that pop culture plays in adoption. And here we can look and listen and watch, especially non-science fiction, non-fantasy movies and television shows to see if AR and VR exists. How is it positioned? Um, what devices are, um, are being used? These are key indicators that we're moving along the adoption curve and we can learn from that. The third is that um, we need to understand that with new technology comes new societal challenges and issues and concerns, and therefore with AR and VR headworn devices in particular, we will need to establish new social contracts. There will be some new legislation as there is already with things like facial recognition, um, and uh, this is an important thing uh, to, to remember. In addition, um, it's interesting to look back and see that when societal concerns bubble up, they're quickly swept under the rug when value and convenience is understood from these devices, and so maybe we don't want to repeat that. So my, I literally have a minute and 38 seconds. I could speak forever about how to learn from the past waves of computing. I myself still consider um, me a student in technology. Um, I've been working in technology since 2005, but I have much to learn, and I feel so grateful that we're here at AWE with many of these of true pioneers who have really created a lot of the foundational elements of which we're building upon. This slide does not cover them all, but they're here. They're gonna grace the stage, talk to them, go to their talks, hear what they have to say, and listen. Speaking of talks, you've gotta go to this talk, and I'm gonna wrap up soon, so I'm gonna see you run out the door, developer track, Grand Ballroom A, you can learn more about the new responsive web. Eric just talked about the reality engine. What is it? How do I get started? Rigel Benton's got you covered. And then head on in tomorrow to our booth, 313, where you can play Summit Scramble. It is the first Web AR game powered by the Reality Engine, built in partnership with Air Cards. You can play it at our booth on a smartphone, on a computer, on a MetaQuest 2, on a Microsoft HoloLens. You can win an iPad. I mean, there's like so many good things. If you want to play it now, play it now. It's a web game. It's at summitscramble.com. Have a headset, use it in a headset. Have a HoloLens, use it in a HoloLens. Uh, tell me all about your experience. Find me outside, summitscramble.com. So thank you. It's so good to be back on the AWE stage. Thank you, AWE, for creating a space for us to be here to reflect and celebrate. Have an awesome event, everybody.